uh, of the book. Was this book written in in, in our language, or you said I it, wrote it in English, but I never translated. Okay, I wrote it in English, but of course I never translated the sources. About half of this book is quotations from various sources, um, and then my colleague Tra Vladimir translated it into Russian. But because we knew it was going to appear in Russian, I only wrote the first draft in English. We've got five or six drafts. You know, you write a book. You, yeah. Uh, all of the subsequent drafts were in Russian, so there never was an English version. What I translated was was the text that was originally appeared in Russian. We never had an English version of that text. We only had an English version of the first draft. After that, he and I went around in Russian about it. In so the English version of what? Of the of the of the book. Of the book. Yeah, of this the book here that I'm selling wherever it is. Uh -huh. I want to buy a copy. Okay. So this book originally come. The it was published in Russian in uh, 2007 and republished in 2010 uh, because the first. Well, the your, first your original was sold in Russian. Out. What's that? You wrote, wrote it in Russian. Russian. I wrote it in. I wrote the English. first draft in English, and my colleague translated into Russian. We knew it was going to be published in Russian. Yes. So after that, all of the subsequent gra drafts were in Russian. Uh -huh. That's, oh. I know it's complicated. No, it's so you're taking that Russian translation was done by you. Colleague, and yeah. you're translating that back yes, into yes, English, yes. not the original English you wrote. No, no, that's right. Yeah, it was only only the first draft was in English. Yes, sir. Yeah, thank <coughs> you for coming all the way from Montclair, New Jersey. Yeah, to give this uh, excellent lecture. Well, thank you very much for coming. Uh, my question is on the uh, issue of the Katan Forest. Yes. Was that in Khrushchev's speech? No, that was not. Uh, he no, didn't he doesn't mention Katan. No. no. Uh, there's a a lot of stuff has, has come out about the Katyn Forest Massacre in the last 20 years, and a lot of stuff has come out within the last 15 months. So I have a web page. I believe it is the only place you can go in English that sums up all of this, all of the evidence that exists. The, the books that are published on the Katyn Massacre, all of which blame the Soviets, okay? They all blame the Soviets. Uh, do not deal honestly with the evidence that we have. They, they, they stack the deck. They, they don't discuss the evidence that tends to suggest the Soviets were false and that some of the evidence that, that, that seems to be to point to them to the Soviets being guilty looks very much like a forgery. There's a, so you have to read my, my web page. I don't make a, I don't make a you know, I haven't, I, I haven't published anything other than this web page, but if you, but it's the only place you can get all this evidence. There. It was the web page. Oh, yeah, I'm going to give you all that stuff. Yes, yes. I imagine that we could put in the words Grover Fur yeah. separate in the top of our pages and get Google. all of these options. Yeah. It just, it just put in Grover Fur and click whatever your web, whatever your uh, en entry site entry page is, yeah, it'll come uh, which is a very handy kind of a behavior. Yeah, that's right. I, I, what I wondered about is, uh, you said something that made it seem as though the uh, whole kind of coming apart of the Soviet Union's mm -hmm. effort, which you seem to admire a great deal, okay, just wanted to... Soviet, yes. Yeah, you yes. said it. Well. Um, <clears throat> was internal, and what I uh, would mm -hmm. have been lectured to by a very close person is that it was so aided by World War II as to it really forced the end of the experiment that they couldn't go on anymore. Mm -hmm. The best and brightest died on the front lines and so forth. And so it wasn't only the internal mm -hmm. conflicts and etc. as you, uh, as we all know about and as you corrected to a degree, but this force, this, this horrible force that really ended the effort, uh, what do you think? Uh, and there's people out there that have... I think, uh, I think that, um, you know, the cl a classic way of looking at, uh, at uh, dialectical materialism says the internal contradictions are primary contradictions, and the external contradictions condition the development of the internal contradictions, but the internal contradictions are primary. Uh, so I'm sort of proceeding. I think that that's the case. I think that um, that uh, I think there's also the issue that the, the Soviet Union was was the first. They were the first. They were bound to make lots of significant errors. You know, every human process that takes place uh, through trial and error. So I think that um, 
that that also needs to be taken into account. What I'm really trying to suggest is that we need to learn right. from the Soviet experience, not simply to slavishly repeat it, although, of course, we couldn't do that anyway. We have to examine it. I think the, it's a great textbook for, for us. Mm -hmm. if we we, we got to learn how to read it. The reason that I bring it up is because we're all supporting various levels of struggle here and around the world, and if we can see the effect mm -hmm. of the imperialist aggression against us as limiting the efforts to correct the errors and, mm -hmm. and, and uh, mm -hmm. actual wrongdoings and so forth, we don't get the time to work on those because the Imperium comes in and interjects, uh, uh, you know, uh, stops us trying. It's a big job to change the world, but that's... <laughs> but the world needs changing. Oh. The world needs changing, so... Uh, yes, sir. And then... Third then. Small yeah, we're here for first and then back to Spirit. Just people out there. Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, I haven't seen them lately. Yeah, I, I think it, uh, you know, your presentation is very good. Uh, provides a lot of information up? and analysis. We can't hear I think your presentation was very good. Uh, it provides an uh, excellent framework for uh, they can't hear how, how, to, um, how to assess historical facts and historical trends and so forth. Um, and you debunk very well certain um, rather obvious on one hand, but on the other hand it may not be so obvious to other people who don't study. Um, uh, refuted all these various lies and slanders against Stalin. Yeah. Uh, I think that's good. I think there's another feature, though, that uh, I would like to offer. Uh, you know, when I first came to the movement, um, I remember reading uh, a um, old Communist Party member. I was kind of a uh, national reformer at the time. They gave me a copy of Stalin's book uh, on the national question, this collection of, of S you know, essays. And I remember reading it, and uh, I was very impressed. Uh, I remember I met a person who called himself a Trotskyite, and he was going on and on about how Stalin was evil, terrible, he crushed democracy, he, you know, he, he just massacred people for fun, that kind of stuff. Uh, and I listened to the book, I said, this, is, this doesn't sound right, mm. you know. Um, just on the, I was new, just on the theoretical questions raised by Stalin and his writings, it, you know, it seemed that uh, what, he, uh, what he had done was correct. And also, um, I began to study more clearly about the whole doctrine that Marx had developed on the dictatorship of the proletariat. It seemed to me that, you know, it's, hey, there's a civil war going on between the revolution and counter-revolution. And uh, Marx had criticized sharply the Paris Commune for being too lax, right? And so, in the period of transition, there's going to be suppression of the bourgeoisie. That's just a fact. Anybody who supports the bourgeoisie has to be suppressed. I would attack Stalin if, if he didn't suppress the counter-revolution, okay? Uh, not him personally, but his leadership of the Central Committee, leadership of the masses, and uh, directing a struggle against him. The thing that sticks out in my mind is that the revisionism has come up you know, over the years, it incorporated in the Communist Party USA with uh, Browder and that whole thing, which concocted the theory that there was such a thing as a state that didn't suppress the counter-revolution, or a state that didn't suppress the revolution that we're living under, okay? That played into the hands, you know, of all the slanders against Stalin. So you had people wandering around that there was such a thing as a state that didn't suppress nobody, you know? And we have democracy, and that's not a suppressive uh, state. Well, that's a joke. It's a horrible joke, a criminal joke, because Lenin kept hammering away every state is an organ of oppression of one class by the other. And as our job in the proletarian revolution is to establish a state that's broad democracy for masses, but ruthless in crushing the counter-revolution. Right and I think that that is a most <coughs> important thing, in addition to what you're doing, that we have to link with Stalin, you know? We shouldn't be running from Stalin, well, he, he never used uh, means of suppressing the counter-revolution. No, he did. Uh, I, well, what and the, uh, I think it that that is the thing that's most important now because you see these Occupy movement mm -hmm. stuff that's about right. this dreamland state that the U.S. state is not a repressive regime. Well, they're learning now, you know, the hard way that that's not true. Of course, you see? And uh, that's some education that's going on. It's not intended to a certain degree, but uh, uh, it's going on. So we, we, should, we should 
take that practical lesson and link it up with the theoretical question. It's been argued out going all the way back to 1840s over the Communist Manifesto that the machine that's set up by one class to hold down the other you know, is necessary in the transition period. That's all. I'm sorry to get Thanks, carried yeah. 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 I, I would like to clarify, I just, just want to make it clear that what I do here, I'm not setting myself up as a theoretician. I don't pretend to be a theoretician. Obviously, that's very important. I'm not trying to belittle its importance. But what I have to offer is historical research. It has a role. Historical research plays a role. But it's not the whole story, right? It's not, it's not everything that needs to, needs to be uh, discussed. I mean, it can condition and maybe provide some, some information to those to, to, to help us arrive at correct theoretical uh, positions. But I'm not pretending that the work that I have written that I've presented to you today contains new theoretical insights. It's simply historical research, and to a large extent, uh, you know. So that, 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 those are some of its limitations, all right? I think it's important, but it has it has limitations. It's not do uh, anything like the whole job. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, and, and first, just to follow up on, on the brother's remarks, uh, you know, Khrushchev's secret speech went with a public speech, where they introduced the three peacefuls, most mm -hmm. notably peaceful transition. Mm -hmm. So you need to sort out, mm -hmm. you know, what was the effect of of, uh, of all of that happening, not just the secret speech. I just had one little question. Certainly. You started out, at, and you pointed out, I think correctly, that you know you can't have a historical career uh, in, in uh, Soviet history without being anti-communist. Yes. Um, and then you talked about the contribution of a historian named Arch Getty yes. exploding some of the Cold War stuff. So uh, is there a contradiction there, or, or what are we really trying to say? Well, um, that's a good point. Um, Getty has, I, I like, I, I, I have met him a long time ago, I've corresponded with him much more recently, and I have a lot of respect for his work, but he's very careful not to say certain things. He's, uh, and the same with Mark Tauber, whose work I also mentioned, very careful, you have to be very careful to remain on a, on a, uh, a very empirical level. To just talk about the, the facts that they discover in their research, um, because to draw the to draw conclusions, if you, the danger is in drawing conclusions that don't fit the anti-communist paradigm. That's what, and and they know that, and they at least I believe that they know that because they consistently don't do that. <laughs> so therefore, a book like this, for example, I just tell you, you know, uh, Getty emailed me and he said he liked this book a lot. But I, I would not ask him to say that publicly, uh, because that would put him in a difficult position, and I'm pretty sure he wouldn't say it publicly. So if he had written the book, he would have titled it Khrushchev Spoke. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he shies away from... You have to... I, you have to... If you want a career in that field, you cannot buck the anti-communist paradigm. You can say some things that are consistent with... Another paradigm, you can say some things that are very useful and consistent with the kind of research that I do, but you can't openly come out and say that the anti-communist paradigm is false. Yes. Yes, sir. Um, just kind of following up on what he said, uh, there was a book called Life and Terror Under Stalin yes, by, by Thurston. Thurston. Yes. And apparently he's not involved in this stuff anymore because yes. of the specifics of... Yeah, he's a friend... Do. Yes, he's a... Uh, Bob Thurston's book is the best one in English, it was published in 1996. It still contains, because there's a limitation of not a lot of the documents that we have now were available then, so there's some limitations to it, but it, uh, it but Thurston was, was a bold guy, and he took on the anti-communist paradigm <coughs> about as frontally as anybody can, and was essentially driven out of the field. He still does history, but he doesn't do history of the Soviet Union anymore. And he got, that book got terribly, terribly panned. And uh, people in the field uh, at the time liked it. I mean, people who were a little bit more honest, but it got it got it got blasted because he didn't come to the correct, uh, you know, conclusions. Now he already had tenure; they couldn't really dismiss him by that time. And it, there's a lot of good stuff in that book. What was the title of that book? Oh, it's it's Life and Terror under Stalin. Life and Terror Terror in Stalin's Russia, 1934 to 1941. Yale University Press, 1996. It is. I mean, the research is out of date now, right? We have a lot more stuff now. 
But uh, yeah, I mean, I correspond with him all the time. He's a he's a really he's a really good guy. But he doesn't do Soviet research anymore. Okay, and that's that's part of the reason why is that he uh, got so so viciously attacked in his in his field. He's a very well, smart guy. Just to the, mm. just sort of add a little piece on that, and then yeah. I'll stop. Sure. When I first read the book. It was reviewed in the New York Times Sunday Book Review, mm -hmm. and there was also another book written by a guy who did a psychological profile of Stalin, and the, and the reviewer basically said, this is really a good book, even though he doesn't have a lot of facts right, like he didn't have Lenin's birthday right. So, now this other book is, according to the, this reviewer, this is a dangerous book mm -hmm. because it's published under a prestigious Yale University mm -hmm. and that the guy has all kinds of archival evidence at the time to prove his assertions that he went through one, sort of similar to this. Mm -hmm. did, did Stalin kill his second wife? Did this happen? So he goes through all of that and says, yes, this is all factually this. He doesn't dispute any of the facts. It just says but ends with the conclusion in the review, this book is dangerous and it's tantamount to Holocaust denial. Now, who's going to touch somebody yeah. who gets thrown into that? <laughs> you know what I mean? When it comes to that. So I can just imagine that none of this is going to be on the front page of the Times. Yeah, I've, I've been called a Holocaust, you know, what you write is tantamount to Holocaust denial quite a number of times. Uh, that just happens. If you, if you don't bow down to the to the, the demonized portrait yeah, of the Soviet of Union under Stalin and Stalin himself. But when you when, I, when you ask, okay, uh, okay, uh, you say Stalin was a bad guy, well, he must have done some bad things. So what are those bad things? Let's take a look at that. You shouldn't call anybody a criminal, right, criminal monster, unless you can specifically point to some specific things that he did. These are, this is professional historians of this field. They can't do it. Okay, or they can say, well, this, but then, oh, you're covering up all this other evidence. So, I'm telling you, the so history of the Soviet Union that we read, just like Weird Al, Weird Al said, everything you know, I don't mean you, but I mean everything that is known about the Soviet history is wrong. It's just wrong. It's, in my view, it's the biggest cover-up of the 20th century. The biggest historical cover-up of the 20th century is the, the, his, the historical cover-up of the, the cover of the history of the Soviet Union. And, uh, and if if I can do a little bit to dispel that, so that we can go back and actually learn the real lessons instead of of of, of what from what really happened, right? Positive and negative, whatever they are, then uh, and then that way contribute to uh, the next effort, right? To are doing it better the next time. Uh, if not if not us here, then the the next generation. Then I'll, I'll be very glad to have done that. Yes, sir. Yeah. Do you have any comment about? fact that so many of the um, Bolshevik leaders were put on trial. I mean, what, what was the political background? I mean, how'd that happen? That they started off as Bolshevik leaders and then well, tried it, to destroy the revolution. Very oh, briefly, you know, they didn't. Okay, very briefly. Very few people bothered to to read the trial transcripts. The trial transcript is a very partial trial transcript of the first trial. It's not very long. The one of the second trial is uh, 500 pages long, the second Moscow trial, January 37. The one of the um, March 1938 Bukharin trial, the third Moscow trial, is 800 pages long. Uh, and there's a lot of secondary literature surrounding all of that. Now, very few people bother to read that. Uh, and just reading it, of course, is not enough. You have to actually study it. Uh, if you read those transcripts and you read uh, the, the uh, primary source material surrounding the trial, because we have a fair amount of that now, not as much as we'd like, of course, the Russian government keeps most of it secret, but there's a lot. If you read that, you understand that <coughs> Zinoviev and Kamenev and company, they didn't see themselves as destroying the revolution, Trotsky. They didn't posit themselves as destroying the revolution. What they thought is that they wanted to save the revolution, that Stalin's policy of uh, crash industrialization, uh, collectivization, which was to a great extent uh, forced collectivization, that this was uh, going to so weaken the society, there would be so much chaos and civil war, peasant revolts and so on and so on, that um, the uh, foreign 
enemies would invade, would conquer, you know, would conquer it, would destroy the revolution, and the, the, so, so to save the revolution, now, this is what they said, okay, to save the revolution, we've got to stop this. And if the only way to stop it is by killing Stalin and a few other people, then that's what we have to do. That's what we got to do. Um, Trotsky, I think the evidence shows, on the evidence, Trotsky did collaborate with the Germans and Japanese, but it wasn't like he loved, he loved the fascists. That wasn't what it was all about. Anybody, and, and by the way, Bukharin and the rest of them did too, so here's, but the logic is, I think, pretty clear. If you read all this document, they say it. They lay it all out. They say, listen, if we're going to try to have a coup in the Soviet Union, right, take over from Stalin, and we want to be the government because he's leading the revolution to perdition, okay, to ruin. If we're going to have a coup, that's going to cause a lot of internal, uh, internal dissent. That's going to cause, uh, you know, the division, perhaps a civil war, so on and so forth. We have to get agreements from the Germans and Japanese first that they're not going to just come in, invade, take over, and you know, sort of get rid of all of us and get it all over. That's what they said. So therefore, we have to make our deals with them first. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's the logic. Now they didn't see that at the time they were doing it, or at least it appears they say they didn't see that, and it's it's credible to them. They didn't see that as as uh, as uh, betraying the revolution. I mean. Others saw it that way. Stalin and company saw it that way. We may see it that way. But they didn't see it that way. They saw that this was stopping this crazy, crazy plan that had no chance of success. Stalin's plan. They were, they were, they were thrown into some uh, confusion by the fact that Stalin's plan did seem to work largely, largely, you know, with some serious problems, but it did seem to more or less work. So they never expected it would work. But, <coughs> but by then the die was cast. They'd already done this other stuff. So. so that's what was going on. Now the way in which I, I'm reading Trotsky's works during the 30s, uh, the, the Bolton of the Opposition, and he wrote a lot of stuff. And what the way he poses, he sets up a straw man. He says, how could these people who were in the revolution, they were Bolsheviks for many years, and so on, how could they suddenly decide that capitalism is better, that fascism is better? They couldn't. Therefore, this all these charges are bullshit. But that's not what happened. If you, okay, that's a straw man. That's not what was going on at all. That's not what they were saying. That's not what was going on at the Moscow trials. That's not what they were confessing to. They never confessed to anything like that. So that's a straw man. But because people don't go and read these primary sources, which are they're not hard to get, but they're long and they're you know whatever. People take that, 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 that statement as, as, a, as a statement of what was going on, and it wasn't what was going on. Does that answer your question at all? Okay, thanks. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. Uh, two, yes, sir. And then you. Oh, well, who, who were the representatives of the Germans and the Japanese that were meeting with the, the Zenobia people, and who were the representatives of the Zenobia and Bukharan people that were meeting with these representatives? Well, Roddick talks about it. But what your uh, <laughs> names are named in the in the in the uh, in the primary sources, not only in the transcript of the Moscow trials, but in some of the pre-trial interrogations that he had. Names are named. What we don't have, and what. You know, some people just say, well, if we don't have this, then, it, then the ball game's over. What we don't have are any documents from the German archives that say, uh, you know, dear Fuhrer, today I met with Radek or some representative of... However, here's a, we do have some interesting things, all right? Uh, let me just tell you one thing, okay? Just one thing, real quick. Uh, there's a guy, he's now dead, he died as a professor a guy named Alvin Cooks, C-O-O-X. He taught uh, someplace in the Midwest. Uh, who was, uh, he had a rare skill. He knew Russian, Japanese, and English. He was, a, he was a, in intelligence during World War II. So he knew Russian and Japanese. He spent his life studying Russo-Japanese relations. He was an intensely anti-communist guy, as, you know, most of the people in this field are. Uh, towards the end of his life, he published uh, very interesting articles. He... Uh, went to Japan, spent a long time in Japan, he found the Japanese officers, now retired, who had 
um, been in charge of keeping of, of uh, keeping an eye on the highest ranking defector from the Soviet Union uh, during the 30s, that whoever defected, which is a, 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 an NKVD general named Genrich, which means Heinrich or Henry, Lyushkov. He was Yezhov's, one of Yezhov's right-hand men. And he defected to the Japanese in June 1938. And these, and, and the Japanese, uh, he wrote some propaganda, and the Japanese killed him in 1945 when the Russians were about to take over, and he shot him. So, uh, uh, Kooks found the people who had handled him, including the guy who shot him, but other people too. And he debriefed them. He talked to them over a long, long period of time. And they told, he, Lushkov told them, the Japanese, that these conspiracies really did exist. And he named names among the generals, among the marshals, among, uh, he named Rikov, who was uh, Bukharin's co-defendant of the 1938 trials. So this this NKVD general told the Japanese that now publicly he didn't. He said it was all made up. He worked for the ja he was employed by the, the propaganda division of the Japanese army, and he wrote some articles that, when he said publicly it's all fabrication. There are no conspiracies. But what he told the Japanese Japanese military was that these conspiracies did exist. Well, how are they meeting? How are these Japanese representatives in Japan meeting with? people in the Soviet Union and, and planning this... Uh, well, conspiracy. according to... Uh, that's a good question. And uh, the... the, the uh, Sokolnikov, who was the... Uh, Roddick and Sokolnikov were, I guess, the two best-known defendants in the 1930s, the January 1937 trial. Sokolnikov said that uh, Ota, who was the... Um, the head of the Japanese... I think, it was a, I, mean, I think it was the consul. I have to look this up. He was either the, either the consul for trade or he was just the, the consul uh, for the Japanese government. And he was a well-known well diplomat. Had met directly with him. Okay. So uh, evidently, at least in some cases, took it, uh, at least in some cases, that's, that's the way it happened. We also we have, some other, we have some other evidence, too, that in some cases it was actually Japanese or German military attaches or diplomats who met with these figures, high-ranking figures. That's, that's the information we have. How are we doing time-wise? I want to have time mm -hmm. before you all leave. Mm -hmm. Has anybody got to leave in the next 15 minutes? Mm -hmm. yeah, I want to have time. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And I want to have time to uh, take another question or so, and then I'm going to do the book signing. Okay. They have some books, and if somebody wants to buy some a book, I'd be glad to sign it for you, and all that kind of thing. Maybe if Bob is here, he can go get the books, because they're in the other right room. Here. Right here. Oh, they're there? Okay, good. Could somebody just drag them in? Uh, <laughs> What's that? Yeah, well, um, I, oh, yeah, listen, here.